and community engagement committee of the Community Advisory Board CAB, established by the Community Corrections Partnership, CCP. First of all, we'll start with introductions, and I'd like to ask Ariana if she could kindly call roll in order to establish quorum. And we would ask that our CAB members identify your region of Contra Costa County. Yes, Ozzie Carter. Yes, Ozzie Carter, East County. Brenda Lee. Brenda Lee, West County. Reverend Julius Van Hook. Not hearing or seeing. We have two members present. Um, quorum is established. Thank you so much, Gariana. Next, we'd like to enter, have introductions from our ORJ staff, and then we'll proceed with any other county agencies that might be present or any other members of our audience that would like to identify themselves. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Gariana Youngblood. I am the ASA2 for the ORJ. Good morning. My name is Reverend Alexandria Spearman. I am a chaplain at the Juvenile Hall and then an applicant for this subcommittee. Okay, you can go ahead and I know. Um, well, I'm the Lau family. Okay. And I see that we have another member that is uh, of the community that has joined us. If you'd like to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. Tiffany and I am. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, board members and, and uh, community members for your time and prospective board members for your time and commitment to CAB. And as we move forward, let's uh, review some housekeeping items. Uh, we don't have individuals in the public outside of the participants who are online. Um, and we just go through um, the hand raise feature, and we usually um, hear comments first from the board and then from the public by raising your hand. Prior to moving to announcements in our agenda, let's take a moment to review our purpose and some of OCEC's responsibilities. First of all, our primary purpose is to establish outreach methods to engage our community at large. And some of our responsibilities, but not all, is membership cultivation, which includes recruitment, new member orientation, and succession planning for the Community Advisory Board under the CCP. We'll go forward now with announcements. Are there any announcements from board members? None from, me. None from board members. Any announcements from our online Zoom members? No announcements. Any announcements from the room? No announcements. So we're moving on. Our next item is public comment on any item under the jurisdiction of the Community Advisory Board that is the OCEC subcommittee that is not on this agenda. Hearing none, we'll move to item number three, the approval of minutes from the April 16th CAP Standing Committee meeting. Ariana, could you please, um, thank you. Go through our record of action. I'll be looking for a motion and a second. I, I move that we approve the minutes from the uh, April, the April 16th meeting. This is Brenda Lee. Yes. <laughs> and I second. This is Ozzie Carter. <clears throat> we will now ask for a vote. I Ariana. have a. I have a motion. I have a second. Brenda Lee, how do you? Yes. Ozzie Carter? Yes. Motion carries. Fantastic. Now we're moving on to the most uh, exciting part of our agenda, and that's to discuss CAB applications for new membership to be considered for approval by the full body. And if we can look at attachment two, pages seven through 21. And our first uh, candidate is Tiffany Anaya. And uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome Tiffany. And I'd like 
if you'd like to give us just a little uh, synopsis of your your uh, experiences and why you want to be a part of of uh, this uh, of the cab. Thank you, Adi. The reason I'm interested in being a part of the Community Advisory Board because I have um, been a part of the reentry community, I guess, I suppose since birth, um, from a very young age, um, secondhand um, impacted from my parents um, being intertwined with the criminal justice system and um, being a part of other systems and being raised by family members in my community um, to, you know, my own um, adolescence as a juvenile and early adulthood, um, myself experiencing the criminal justice system um, from my career and my professional experience working with reentry for the past 10 years. Um, I've worked in reentry across the county, um, starting in East Contra Costa County. And I am now working for the hub of all reentry services for all of West Contra Costa County and currently a Rubicon program employee, which um, we are a countywide agency by poverty. Um, I know firsthand um, how the criminal justice system can impact others. And I also know um, first and second hand um, what reentry services, what difference it can make for our returning community members and just the broad. Um, communities that reentry members are a part of. Um, you know, I was just in a conversation the other day, you know, our mothers, our students, our children, you know, every group, um, there's reentry. It's not just reentry, you know, it can be professionals, it can be disabled, it can be veterans, working class, um, retired. Um, reentry is, you know, um, does not discriminate basically. Um, everyone can be within a reentry community. I'm very passionate um, for this population and I would like to serve as the board um, since I have also been attending as a community member of the Community Advisory Board for the past six years. Thank you, Tiffany. And yes, you've been a you've been a visible participant here at the regular CAP meetings, and that's uh, part of your uh, vested interest, and we really appreciate your participation. And now I would like to ask our board members if there are any questions that you would like to ask. Sure. Uh, excuse me. This is Brenda Lee. Uh, Tiffany, I see. I mean, Tiffany, I'm sorry, Ayana. I was, you are, you are Tiffany. My names yeah. are getting confused. Okay. I understand you said you've had experience with the, uh, the juvenile system as a young woman, but can, Without going into detail, can you explain some of the issues that you encountered in the system as a young woman? Yes. In my personal experience, um, really having a bias towards the criminal justice system, being separated from my own parents, I really was not fond of law enforcement, courts, or those government systems. And once I became intertwined and a part of that system, it really... <laughs> It really opened the doors for me to go into the adult uh, criminal justice system because I had already uh, gone past the fear of being arrested and going to a juvenile detention facility. Uh, I, I definitely, um, it definitely did. Uh, basically, once I was my parent um, and I was that fear, I seen that, you know, I survived it, you know, I did my time, I did my juvenile call, I did a house arrest and all of those things. And um, it really, it, it wasn't real change. There was no rehabilitation, there was juvenile probation. Um, and I continued in my same environment, my same social circle, still enough support um, where I continued on as the early adult into the criminal justice system. Um, of course, that time there wasn't ranch free services like there is now. Um, and it was a very traumatic experience. Um, and I believe that it was a part of that generational uh, curse and traumas. Well, you can give us, you can, should you be selected, you would give us a, a clear, a clearer understanding of 
the juveniles in, in the system and females, I, because I know a lot of the things that are aboard now, you know, cab and so it, it's directed toward men. And so now if we could, if you were selected, we would have a better view of how we can help women. So I thank you for, 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 for applying. I appreciate that. Thank you, Brenda. So Tiffany, I have a question for you. How do you approach decision-making in situations where there may be a differing opinions or conflicting priorities? I always respect individuals' um, experience, education, um, or their standpoint. Um, and, um, you know, that is their individual. And I always stand strong in my own um, personal and lived experience, as well as my uh, professional experience and educational background as well. Um, and whenever I hear language that is just really not trauma informed and really hurts old language, I always kindly just share some um, new language or language that I utilize on a daily basis with our community members um, and just share education. Thank you. I, I appreciate that answer. <laughs> I do. I do have another question, Tiffany. Can you please provide an example of a successful community-based project or initiative you have been involved in before? Of course. <clears throat> I would say the latest would be uh, this past Friday. Uh, I supported the coordinating a clean slate day in partnership with the Contra Costa County Public Defender's Office where we were able to serve over 150 individuals with record expungement, probation termination, and registration relief. Uh, we also had over 20 community-based organizations present, tabling, sharing all of their programs and services with everyone in attendance, in addition to hourly raffles. Um, and this is an annual event um, that we have been hosting and coordinating here at the center um, since 2018 or 2019, I want to believe. Uh, and that was just one um, community event or project initiative that has um, always been really successful. And um, they've actually gotten better with every year. This year, we really had a streamlined system and number system. Um, so all of our community members were very happy. They knew what number they were. They were able to network with the resources until it was their time to come over to the center and meet with the attorney um, to discuss eligibility work on personal statements and the next steps. Very impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Do you so, have any more questions? I just want one. I, uh, Tiffany, I understand you are now a site manager. Um, so how, how does that impact your, your working as a site manager versus I understand you also have more what a lead entry coach so you will, did you move from the lead entry coach into the site manager? And which yes, site is you. it that you manage? Okay. Thank you for asking, Brenda. I actually take um, a lot of pride in uh, my growth and my journey through reentry. Um, I did start as you know a temporary um, on-the-job experience um, with nonprofit agencies, and it was very trying for about two years. Um, you know. I can get, you know, I can apply, I have a great resume. Um, I like to think that I'm personable. And, um, you know, interviews was not the problem. I would even get job offers. It was always the background check, you know. Um, I would give in notice with my temporary that I was transitioning out in two weeks and even started a few places. And then it's always, you know, this traumatic, this fear of a supervisor wanting to speak with me, wanting to speak with me in private. So they got the background, like, um, not being able to negotiate or sway at that time, you know, I had no connections, barely legal aid or any legal services to support me with the letter, just stating that, you know, my background had nothing to do with the job duties or um, the responsibility I would be holding at with the company. Um, however, after, you know, trying and trying and trying, um, taking all those notes to a yes, I did um, get into a branch with a nonprofit organization where I was able to start as a, a job developer and 
naturally I was really good at looking for work, <laughs> supporting with individuals' resumes, mock interviewing, because I had been doing it with no luck for two years. Really good too. <laughs> um, from there, we were a job developer. I was able to do really good at that, networking with you know HR managers, um, business owners, local employers, recruiting managers. Um, and then I had kind of came on to Rubicon where and we're serving like a broader purpose of not just employment, but really fighting poverty. You know, the other things that come along with employment too, like housing, finance, health and wellness. Um, so I applied for the Reentry Success Center as a coach and I found great joy serving the whole person instead of having to turn individuals away because they weren't looking for full-time employment, because they were receiving disability and only looking for part-time work. Um, from here, I was able to grow into a lead reentry coach and um, support the staff here, um, where most recently, then I went into interim site manager. November 16th, I've become site manager um, with great pride and joy, um, serving the community and also developing our team to serve the community who I so much identify with myself. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. I really, really, really appreciate your tenacity. And it takes tenacity when uh, navigating the justice system and the reentry process and family reunification and that whole ball of wax that we have to untwine, we have to take it apart, we have to find where we fit in. And definitely you are a role model for others. And um, we definitely look forward to um, uh, the adventure and the journey I do have one last question though, and, um, and, and it's pertinent that I ask this question because um, being a part of uh, the Community Advisory Board for the last several years, uh, one of the things that I found that was most crucial was communication. And communication oftentimes comes in forms of emails, texts, and uh, <clears throat> primarily emails and texts and, or, and phone calls. And um, response times. Uh, how how uh, do you incorporate effectiveness as far as your response and responses to uh, communication from outside of maybe outside of your employment to include being a board member? Because and I I'll explain that as far as um, with board members, oftentimes their quorum issues meaning we have to have X amount of board members present in, in order to actually facilitate a meeting. And sometimes there can be just a difference of five or 10 minutes of, of, being, of being able to respond. Um, my question is, how do you handle those types of situations when dealing with uh, uh, time restraints? Thank you for asking, Ozzy. I am really big on communication myself. Um, I prefer email and um, I would say anyone outside of like the reentry success center or the reentry network, I do my best to reply within um, two business days. However, anyone, you know, amongst our team or naturally, um, if I were to be voted on the community advisory board, I also would look the board members as a part of my team and I would have an obligation to respond to those individuals as soon as I was, I was able. Um, so I would be expected um, to respond to someone within a business day. Um, unless there was more thought and consideration to take um, 24 to 48 business hours. And as far as I'm um, being flexible or, um, you know, having quorum, I would definitely um, strive to arrive within 15 minutes of the start time of meetings because I know how traffic can be getting out to Martinez coming from east or west. And also I have been present in times where um, we were, trying to get to quorum and I was like, you know, if I was a board member, then I could just hop right on in there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you, Tiffany, for that. That's sometimes a real hard question for me to really ask, but thank you for your responses. Do we have any other questions? <clears throat> oh, well, thank you, Tiffany. Um, at this time, this is true. We're going to go to our next candidate. Gariana is uh, 
Edwin Walters online? No, he is not present on Zoom. Okay, thank you. Not in the room. What? I said he's not in the room. Oh. <laughs> so we're going, going to move on, on to Alexandria Spearman, ap her application. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Reverend Alexandria Spearman. Hello. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you. Absolutely. Um, we're going to ask you to give a brief overview, although you have been before um, OCEC previously. And so um, primarily we'll just, you know, give us a brief overview for the record, and then we'll ask you a few questions. Sure. Of myself and why I'd like to work with you all, yes. Uh, well, Absolutely. I sure. Well, I currently serve as a chaplain at the juvenile hall and working with youth in reentry and on the community success pathways. And I grew up uh, with principles of social justice, service learning, and resourcing for myself and for others. And uh, within my neighborhood, uh, there was a church, a boys and girls club, a youth center, a, a, and a Parks and Recreation Center, and all of those were helpful in uh, providing support to young adults and being able, youth, young adults, to so just the whole community. And I grew up learning that as a practice and have taken that into my work. It is my passion uh, just to walk with uh, young folks, remembering myself being isolated, growing from childhood to adulthood, and it's my passion to work with the young folks as they transition through that and companion them as we, all the paperwork and documentation and all those things that they need to do are important. That the emotional state is very important to me. How are you dealing and managing with the fear, anger, guilt, and shame as you're doing all of these and as you hit these roadblocks? And so as a chaplain, it is my, I don't know, my calling <laughs> to support and and walk and resource in those ways. And so I'm excited because we, I just want to be present as a companion and connect and resource. And I trust individuals uh, to make their own decisions and to go forward with what they have within themselves. And I just like to be a cheerleader and say, yes, Yes, <laughs> yes, you got it. So that's why I would like to work with you all and just be be a present help. Yes, ma'am. That's incredible. I, I love the fact that uh, the cheerleading aspect because you know definitely um, that emotional state uh, is important and to be there, to be that companion and to help individuals walk through the processes. And, and that's very valuable to our reentry populations, to everyone, to, to anyone in the world. And thank you for uh, sharing that with us. So we're gonna open up for questions from board members. <clears throat> Hello, Alexandria. You know me, I don't think I have any more questions. I've asked all the questions before, but I do notice I was really impressed with you. Uh, you served on the what, Allen Temple Baptist Church Prophetic Justice Ministry? What exactly was that? Oh, uh, Miss Brenda, so under uh, Reverend Daniel Buford, we uh, worked with, I'm trying to think back now. Um, so some of the projects that we did, they were really socially involved. So some of the projects we did uh, when, uh, during voting season, we, uh, one of the projects was to look at what bills and measures were coming out for the community. A lot of uh, a lot of bills and measures will come out, but folks don't really know what they are. They tend to just click and vote and go with what people say. But I organized a workshop to sort of break down what these meant, what the pros and the cons were 
which was helpful for the folks to decide where they were gonna vote, kind of break down the language of that. Some of the other projects included uh, in Oakland, when they were building the new bus route, there were uh, the planners, the city planners came and showed us the blueprints and showed us how the transit routes would change. And my team in Prophetic Justice was advocating for uh, the small businesses that would lose business because the bus stops would be further spread out and how would that work? How would that impact the community? And some of those, those were some of our projects and really what they call speaking truth to power and saying, hey, while you're making these big changes at the top, let's think about how they're affecting the people uh, on the day-to-day -day basis, the people who are literally going to be taking the bus. How is it going to be impactful that the bus stops are from the side of the street now in the middle of the street? What is that going to, how is that going to impact the people? and talking with the people and just trying to navigate their feelings around fear and anger and, and mediate the possibilities of the future. Yes. <clears throat> they included, they're also included in that prophetic justice, a, a training program that where we looked at the, the toxic triangle, Oakland, Richmond and San Francisco and really just getting uh, an awareness of what different environments look like. So how certain environments, you'll know there's a cash, a check clearing place, or and just, rec I'll just say recognizing the environments that people are in, what services are available, how they can reach them, how helpful they can be, and what we can do as a, a church, a prophetic voice uh, to say, hello, focus on the people, uh, what do they need? Who's hurting them at the top and how it connects? Uh, so that was our, those are some of our, our goals and missions with prophetic justice. <clears throat> One more. Okay. Okay. I didn't want to, okay. So were you, if you were to join CAP, what would be your guiding principle to be a member of CAP? Hmm. it's okay not to have one don't you know but I'm just wondering if you had one I like that question I really do the first thing that comes to mind is resourcing with care resource with care and that's important for me as I'm currently looking uh, for certain, some youth a resource Let's say I'm looking for them a, a specific congregation to join. Currently, when they leave, they like to get connected with a specific church. Now, when I say resource with care, I want to check in with that organization, that church, whoever it is, and see if it's a good fit communication-wise, uh, experientially, is the client or my care, the youth in care going to be comfortable with this place? Are they going to welcome them? Is it actually going to be a place for them to grow and flourish? Or are they going to run into some issues and obstacles? I'd like to personally find out how they're going to care for who we're going to, sh our youth who we're going to send them to. So I'll say that's my guiding principle is resourcing with care. I don't want anybody to turn on somebody and, you know, I wouldn't want that. That would be hurtful. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I would like to piggyback off of that question by asking another question. How do you approach decision-making in situations where there may be differing opinions or conflicting priorities? It's a good question. And I was hoping that you asked me that one. <laughs> um. First, I recognize that there will always be uh, differences of opinions and conflicts. And I have learned to assess the situation and say, I recognize within myself, feel what comes up. If I feel a resistance with that person, um, I'll ask myself, what is it that I can do to move the goal forward, take myself out of the equation, move the goal forward, and look for opportunities to 
not necessarily sway anybody's change of decision, but sort of ask them the question, what are the other options? What are other options? Uh, and look for entry ways to communicate the, the bigger picture, the larger picture's goal. Uh, I'm, yes, and do it uh, mindfully. I recognize that you can't change anyone's mind by force. Uh, and not everyone is open to receiving uh, my opinion. But if I keep the goal in mind and find different ways to enter and see different ways and consider different options, uh, there's more than just um, red or yellow. Uh, there's a whole plethora of options uh, to choose from and ways to engage and look at a subject. And also bringing in, I'll also say bringing in others and my main principles for dealing with folks uh, of different opinions are way, looking for ways to support, clarify, and confront. And confront, not confront, confrontation has a negative connotation, but it's a building activity and makes room for growth. Uh, so doing it in a mindful, uh, peaceable way that does bring about change in how we look at options and what's available. I just love the way that you express that. Yes, definitely um, something that's doable. And I like the idea that you, you know, took your time and thought about it. And um, from what I'm hearing, it's a win-win situation across the board with you. It's coming from your perspective. And I, I you know, from your training, we should probably yeah. That's nothing less coming from um, uh, your your stature and your credibility. Thank you for sharing that. I have one last question, and that's in regards to communication, uh, email, uh, phone calls, and texting. Um, your time frame and how do you handle that, uh, specifically um, with the board, because the board is going to be something outside of your norm. Um, and we, as I expressed earlier that we do have issues with quorum individuals being in the room to make sure that we can move forward in business or there might be some time sensitive information that needs to be conveyed to the different board members for responses so sometimes it becomes crucial so could you give us a little feedback on how you handle situations with communications yes so uh, I'll say one thing, I have been able in my department to hire two new chaplains, which frees up my time for more of what my role is, and it is to actively seek to get on this board as part of my job, <laughs> get on the board so you can be more engaged. And so one of the strategies that I have found that works for me is in the Google feature is starring specific messages from Guyana from right so the cabinet outreach OCEC so when they come in they'll have an extra alert please take a look at this right away and don't let it slip by and I am uh, my schedule has freed up on Thursdays which is when we meet and I am about 20 minutes away from the central location and I'm available via text and I have also, just like Tiffany, have been have sat in meetings sometimes and say, oh, I wish I was a board member because I'm here and I would love to make quorum if it's just one person, right? And so, yes, I'm available via text. It's definitely okay to, to send a text forward uh, to me and uh, making myself available for for the team for as an obligation. But I'm a chosen I like that word Tiffany said as an obligation. I'm obliging myself and committing myself uh, to this work and being present for the needs. Well, thank you for that clarity. We definitely as a board and a subcommittee appreciate you and, and that information that we've gathered today. Um, thank you. Just one moment. Let me confer with this one. Do you have any? No, I'm good. Because you brought up, I was going to bring up communications, but you did it already, so. Well, we have to move to 
You have to take them to put a motion A's. first. I moved them to okay. So the next item for this agenda would be to um, consider for approval by the full body, both Tiffany and Reverend Alexandria Spearman. And this is a vote. We'll be looking for a motion and a second and then a vote. Okay. This is Brenda Lee. I move that Tiffany and Reverend Alexandria be uh, moved forward to the to be accepted on the full board. That's my motion. And I second that. This is Ozzy, and I second that motion. All right, I have a motion and I have a second. Brenda? Yes. Ozzy? Yes. Motion carries. Um, Reverend Alexandria Spearman and Tiffany, I'll send you next steps. Um, Thank you. After today. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We look yeah. forward to your membership yeah. on the board. Yes. Active membership. Active membership <laughs> on the board. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all so much. Okay. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank Do you. Do well. Okay. So, okay. Um, work plan. Where is our work plan? Can you send you a copy of it? Mm -hmm. We have a work plan. So the next item on our agenda is our work plan. Attachment three, pages 22 to 23. So I have a question. I have a question, Gariana, that maybe you can help me with. I recall in one meeting where we were actually talking about uh, the dates and the um, work. Had OCEC looked at the work plan any, at any point this year? Yeah, they looked at it earlier this year. So do we didn't update it? with any of the additions. And I specifically, I, I remember, my memory's not that great. I do remember that we changed um, the ambassador's rollout time from... Uh, I know it was in previous meetings that was said that we're going to develop a timeline for the ambassador's meetings. So it would create more engagement from members to do their meetings. Is that what you're referring to, Ozzy? Um, yes, that also whether or not there had been discussion around the work plan is my primary uh, vantage point and interjecting the conversation, whether or not that that conversation was centered around the work plan or that was just a conversation that we were having within the subcommittee and not yeah. reflective on the work plan. Yeah, the 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 conversation about the ambassador's meetings and the timeline was not a part of the work plan conversation. We discussed the work plan like maybe in February. And when I say discuss, it's was they just looked through it and said it looked good. But if there's something that you would like to add or something that I'd like to change, um, this could be the time and the space for us to do that. And if, so is your question, did we add it to the work plan? Because I don't recall it adding it to the work plan. Right, it wasn't added to the work plan. And then the, the other point that I would like to make is because the, the chair is not here today. And I think the chair should be here to lead the discussion on the work plan, I think would be so that we could actually update it uh, because we still on the work plan, we still have our, this is from 2023. Um, and we're in May and the next time we meet is going to be in June. Okay. Okay. 
So I'm looking for a suggestion, Brenda. Well, wait, so you're asking, okay, I wanna make sure I just get this clear. We, the chair should be leading the discussion on the update of the work plan. Because like you said, this is our previous work plan. There's, I mean, I looked at this, and there are no changes whatsoever. So we need the chair to say, okay, is this gonna be our work plan for 23, 24? Okay, so, um, I mean, I'm trying to figure out, so that is that the question? Because to me, there are two different issues. There is the updated work plan plus the, I think we're trying to set up a schedule for the ambassador meetings. Correct. Okay, now, um, and OCEC was is responsible for setting up the schedule, or at least I'll draft now what the schedule is going to be. That's how I understood it to be. But I we, I need to talk to uh, Reverend Van Hook to see if he's done anything on it because I haven't, you know, I was waiting for him to let me know what is, what do you want to do, right? Okay, and then we had an issue because if he and I were talking, that's quarrel, okay? Right. And we've overstepped our, you know, what I'm saying, we've overstepped our boundaries. So I think that that might be the reason why he held off on it because if he and I were to discuss it offline, you'd have an issue. So we need to discuss it in the meeting. And and have it. I mean, we need to just lay it out so that we so that everyone will know. But from what you from what I understand from you, OCEC should be the starting point. We we set up make up make the draft out the plan. This is how we see it. Is there are there objections to it? That's how I I would view it. But see what I'm saying? We need Reverend Van Hook. So now we'll go to Gariana. Yes. Okay. So Gariana. I have a suggestion that we hold off on the work plan um, because we have some missing pieces. We're missing um, the Reverend Van Hook. And also we're getting ready to have a conflict because we also have the ambassadors roll out pretty soon. I think that's next up. For, we moved that time OCEC moved it up to June to start. I think they, it was asked that you do, do a grid uh, for appointments and when to call and sponsors, just kind of like to kind of have a process so individuals can check in and we can kind of keep up to where individuals are in that process in the hopes of being able to offer assistance. Also, with the fact that we are having new individuals come on board by the time we really get into the meat in, in the weeds of that. So my, my, my suggestion would be that we hold off on the work plan until we have more directions from uh, Reverend Van Hook to be in the room so we can have the conversation. Yeah, we can um, table the work plan if that's what the subcommittee decides. Um, my question is, what if we do table this discussion for the to discuss with the work plan, what questions would you ask, Reverend? Or what from you two, what is missing or what is needed, or what about the work plan that we would find changes? I just want to write it down so just in case we, when we revisit this conversation, um we can pick it off right there. First of all, the responsible persons and resources need to be updated. We have Evan Decker and we have Scott Parsons and Parker here. Gotcha. So we, so we need, need go ahead, Ozzy. Yeah, we need to have assignments that needs to be updated. And we need to really go in into the meet the outcomes and goals to see at this juncture how many of these items have been attempted and where they are in that process and who has been working on them. Because I think some of those things have been done currently, but we need to update update it. And the months, making sure that they, we're in sync with the timelines is what I'm trying to say. Gotcha. And if not, being willing to change them, amend them, um, and then move forward. Because we're halfway through the year next month. Gotcha. Brenda, is there anything that you noticed from the work plan that you would like to discuss at next meeting? Yes, I'm, I'm looking at the um, in fact, task number one, 
which is survey cap on the knowledge base of the current cap members. I'm not quite sure what our goal was for that, or if we decided to table it. Um, I'm always at, you know, I, I see it says ongoing, but ongoing how? Was there, were we to develop a, a survey? Um, I know, and I know Reverend Van Hook was, was the responsible person, but I'm not quite sure what is that, what was he responsible for? The first task is what, you know, now everything else is like, okay, yeah, we do this. Task two is fine. Um, and three, yeah. And I think the PowerPoint presentations and things have been updated. Mm -hmm. My question with the PowerPoint, and we can talk about this at the next meeting, is what are we going to use that for and when are we going to use it? But we don't have to talk, we don't have to discuss that now, but that's just something that I was pondering about the PowerPoint. Well, we're trying to, I, I can answer that. As soon as we can um, collaborate and get into either we outside of the meetings, we've been trying to uh, facilitate have facilitation through first through uh, yeah. faith based organizations. There's been uh, some interviews. Uh, secondary, I think I mentioned um, uh, beat the streets, a possible collaboration there where we can actually do a presentation. We're looking. My vantage point would be to get in an area where there's always. There's always already a base of individuals and resources that we can come in and include our stakeholders and make it a uh, an event where we can actually capitalize off of the space, the resources already there, and those that we bring to do a presentation. Yeah. Um, and I and I agree, and I think that's something that should be considered to be added to the work plan, because I don't know if that's on if presentation or a community engagement event is on here, but I think that would be a great way to outreach to the community and engage um, community members about what's going on with CAB. Because one thing that I found out and was reminded um, was going into faith-based organizations, you might have different individuals who are over various committees, various teams, outreach, and what have you, but the ultimate decision is made by the head of the church, the, the bishop, the pastor, or whatever. So oftentimes I know that we got caught up in the meetings and in the conversations and the interview, possibly spending four to six hours only to have to table it because the the, 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 the head was not interested because there was political politicized and just another can of worms. So after we'd gone all in the weeds to try to get this together, but we wasted six to eight hours uh, of communication and setting up appointments and Zoom time. So those types of situations are going to be across the board, you know, unless we directly talk to the person who is over the congregation. And generally speaking, that's not going to happen. They have administrative assistance and things of that nature. So you have to still go through that process. So um, that's why I decided, I thought, and wanted to bring to the board that it would be great to look at other organizations and do who already have a nuclear space and do a presentation from that vantage point. Maybe uh, some of our CBOs, you know, but we need to look at another vantage point because the other part of that equation is the fact that we have a list of community-based organizations, but there's about a hundred and some churches that are not even on that list because we were looking at them to try to break it down in East County, West County, to kind of like uh, navigate through that process so that we could have one, you know, community base. And maybe there's four churches, five churches in this one uh, radius, three mile radius. And there's one church that has an auditorium that could facilitate a presentation. And then we'd have all the other churches. But that has not worked because there's not really any vested input on actually reaching out to these churches and what have you. So it's just sitting, you know, and where, yes, there's been an attempt to dive into the faith base, but as I explained earlier, you still have those issues with community heads, uh, uh, committee heads, and then the pastoral teams and that approval process and how much energy and time can be spent there. 
and we don't have the bandwidth of individuals who are really hot. Jack, just equipped. <laughs> equipped, equipped, the set, equipped to do. Okay. Right, we're not really equipped, equipped that. to and do that currently because we don't have the, the bandwidth with board members. That's yeah. Just my yeah, and I agree. And I think it's a I think it's a great idea to look at other organizations that you can hold a presentation to get what CAB is doing out there so the community is aware of what's going on and can support the efforts that you guys are trying to uplift. So are we so with the faith based organizations, how are we going to address that issue? Or are we going to set it aside? Because, well, I'm just wondering, because I'm trying to figure it out. Like I said, I'm like, okay, yeah, you have to go through all these layers when it comes to faith-based organizations, okay? Well, I take, for instance, I'm in the AME church. That means you got to go to the pastor, to the pastor, to the elder, to the bishop to get, you know, this authorization. And that's just one denomination. Can you imagine what happens with all the others? So we're sort of in a sticky situation right now because we really do want them to be involved uh, or at least to be informed, okay? Because believe it or not, I've been informing my church. They know about it. It's like, uh, you know, re-entry and it's important and especially in the city of Richmond, okay? That's where I, you know, we, we base a lot of our stuff and there are a lot of um, religious organizations that are helping the community. I'm not sure if they're even focused on the reentry. Okay. And that's the part that I'm interested in the reentry. You know, there's feeding programs, you know, and there's clothing programs, but are we, how can we get them to be, have a vested interest in this? And that's going to be very difficult. And I was hoping Reverend Van Hook would have a, at least he could help us to navigate it, is what I'm thinking. Or maybe if we get Alexandria, maybe she can help us. And maybe uh, Reverend Alexandria could. Yeah, could, you know, you know, maybe. You know, because they're in the faith-based ministry, and I'm sure that they have resources and could probably help us uh, cut through the red tape uh, with their connections. But at, at the juncture, I'm not, per se, an OCEC board a subcommittee, but because it was interesting to me, and I really wanted to see, make sure this became a successful uh, recruitment endeavor, and I, you know, I got my feet wet and, I, and then, it, then it was a reminder. Oh, well, yeah, I remember now you have to really, there's a process. And every organization, every 501c3 mm -hmm. has their own culture and their process. So yeah. you wait, you get it, start getting in the weeds. And yeah. a lot of times individuals look at you, what is your real agenda? You know, because uh, that's another thing that, we uncovered a lot of things that could have possibly been um, a turnoff to them because of how we communicated and um, they might have gotten, you know, people's perceptions of why you're here and what you're doing, you know, are, you have to be really careful. Those are real delicate areas that you can go in um, because people are always wondering, well, well, what's in it for you? You know, why are you, why are you really here? So it has to be coming from a genuine perspective. And that's why I'm saying uh, the Reverend and uh, uh, Reverend Spearman could possibly be door openers, you know, because I, I, lay people are not really going to be successful, especially when you're representing the board, especially when you come, you talk about funding and especially, you know, if they're not affiliated with the county, when you mention county, uh, you know, all kind of flags start flying. Yeah. 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 So it sounds like I'm hearing from the committee that you do want to get faith based organizations involved in like supporting the reentry population, but it sounds like there's a few barriers, but it does seem like Reverend um, Alexander Spearman and Reverend Julius Van Hook could be potential, could help break those barriers. So you can't have discussions on how to support the reentry population using the faith-based organization. Right. And, and and definitely we need to table this work plan because- Yes, definitely. Uh, to just bring it back when we have, uh, you know, more members present. 
Yeah, I think that's a good idea. We have a member joining next month. So I think revisiting the work plan and going through it thoroughly and prioritizing yes. like what we want. And, and as a committee, like deciding what you want to prioritize and assigning who to what. So there's no confusion about like who's doing what and where things are. Absolutely. Yes, definitely. Sounds like okay. a plan. Sounds like a plan. Okay, well, thank you for helping us navigate that, Gariana. We appreciate you. So on attachment four, we'll move to discuss and finalize outreach for membership recruitment, the attachment four. I'm going to suggest that we table this as well. Yes, please. Because this is something that has been, uh, I don't want to say this as we're on recording. <laughs> Yeah, it was a hot topic at um the CAB meeting last month, um a few weeks ago. So yeah, I think it makes sense to table it. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's my here's my question. So um the um what are we calling this? I'm, my brain is the recruitment contact okay, list. The contact list. Um, how did we get this? Where did this? How did how was this generated? Do you know? I drafted it, so I okay. just looked up um, the organization that you guys um, okay. yeah, the organization that you guys mentioned, and you also mentioned like reaching out to like schools. So I just like researched like schools and like professors and just different organizations, and I found their contact list like throughout my search, and I just drafted this list. So if there's like more people that we would want to reach out to, like we can also always add to this list. But this is just the contents that I found based off of the, um, based off of the organizations that the committee subcommittees suggested. And Gariana, this is a great list because um, definitely the schools, as I think I mentioned, they have requirements for field study attending different board meetings, different county um, meetings. And this is a great start. And I think especially, I think we're going to get a lot of responses. And I think it's something that we really need to move forward on. And hopefully yeah. we, um, we have some people who will volunteer. Yeah. And now that you have your flyers, you can easily email out a flyer with your little script um, mm -hmm. to encourage uh, these folks to join the board. Because a lot of, especially in the schools, they also have like programs for like the reentry population. So if you want to hear from more of like the reentry population, that could be a way to like access them. Absolutely. So we're going to table this item. And the next thing, moving on to item seven, is an update on AB 109 annual mini summit planning process. Hmm. And that would be me. Yep. So at this point in time, the things that have been accomplished, I, I brought the mission statement to, to this yeah. subcommittee. I think that we probably need to condense it at some point prior to the mini summit. Um, a letter to participants have been generated and sent out, and I did a Brown Act violation on that one <laughs> by sending it to, to everyone. How many participants did you send it to? You know, all the board members. <laughs> I forgot. Okay. But anyway. Okay. Um, and, and the letter the the um. The invitation is something that I think we're going to resend. Uh, I've gotten responses from um, San Francisco, Santa Clara. Um, I actually resent some information yesterday to Alameda County. They're looking forward to the event. And we're also looking to, as we get closer, to include stakeholders, which would be another, I, I'm, I'm, going to ask the board whether or not they would be in agreement with as cl the closer we get to actually generate some type of flyer as an announcement for the mini summit, for the mini summit and then kind of like send that 
out as well. As we get closer to the summit. Ozzy, I have a question. Is the summit open to like, like everybody, the public, community members? Who would the flyer get sent out to? Stakeholders and community members. Um, and But that could be, present a problem because if we're going to have refreshments, food. And, but if we're part of the Brown Act, don't we have to include the public? We do have to include the public okay. automatically. Okay, so there is open, so it's open to the public also. Right. Besides your stakeholders right. and the CBOs, it is open to the public. Open to the public. Okay. It has to be. Okay. I just want to make sure we get yeah, we're clear on that one. Well, because I don't think the last one, Ozzy, correct me if I'm wrong, was the last one open to the public? I think it has to be because we are a community-based organization. Well, it's, I think it only has to be open to the public if we have a, if we present a quorum. So if like seven of the CAB members want to attend the mini summit, then yes, we would have to present it to the public because now you guys officially made a quorum and so it's like a meeting. But if not all members are present, I don't know if it has to be um, open to the public unless you want it to be open to the public. Oh, no, we want invitation only. If we can do it like that. Yeah, so That's I why think- Fire could be invitation only, that we're inviting you. Just like yeah. the letter to the participants, it's a personal invitation. Yeah, so we just have to be careful around, um, I guess, amongst the members, who's all going to go? That's what I was worried about. We need to know who all plans on attending. Yeah. I pretty much know that. I pretty much know that. Okay. 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 I, I've kind of been picking through the individuals and so that we don't have quorum. Yeah, so it has to probably be one from each subcommittee and... Yes. Yeah. So far. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Mm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hey, I just, I, listen, I just wanted to go because I, I missed the last one and my feelings were hurt because I really wanted to go and Crawford told me I couldn't. Well, I... And Scott went. So, yeah. so this year, um, I've already talked to uh, Jeffrey and I've talked to Rena Moore. They're both going to be speakers. Mm. And, and, and sure. Brenda's going to be there. Okay, and, I'm coming. And I'm coming. All so right. I think, okay. I think, and we're holding it here, correct? We're holding it's it gonna here. Be here. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's going to be in here. My next question is Nicole was present at the next one. And if Jeffrey's going to be there, is Nicole oh. not going to be present? The As the chair and the vice chair of the. Yeah, because they're on the same committee. So them together would make a quorum. Even though he's a speaker? Did you say he's a yeah. speaker? Is he one, he's one of your presenters? Um, but the, we can we can continue to workshop this. I think the summit's in August, so we have time. I guess Nicole won't be coming, huh? Anyway. <laughs> 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 Long as I get an invitation, I'm good. Okay, that's, that's what I'm saying. Long as I get, I get it. Um, yeah, we got to work on that. <laughs> no, we need to find out. Who, stop it. We need to find out who all is interested in coming, and then we may have to gently say, "Well, you know, we can't." Da 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 da. I was simple not coming, not wanting to come. I should say. Just so you know. Okay, keep going on. Keep going. The mini summit, so. And so the other thing that I'd like to share about the mini summit, mini summit I have a, I have a, uh, <laughs> I have an agenda that has to be reconstructed and flushed out. Yeah, I, I, we are working. I got the word. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're yeah. Ozzy, yeah, Ozzy reached out to us, and the ORJ is working on drafting an agenda for the mini summit, and we hope to have it um, to you by the next meeting. You guys are gonna draft it. I think I I think we're gonna work with you to draft it because we need more information on like what all like the contents and what you all want to the mini summit to look like. So so okay. we can draft it, but we just need a little bit more guidance on um the things that you want to see at the summit. Okay. So then there's another item I'd like to present this morning, and that is that this year 
we're going to have keynote speakers. Oh, a keynote speaker. Two keynote speakers oh, two? from the same organization, though. Two They're sharing the platform from home base. Um, they are a program within, they partner with the criminal legal system to end homelessness. Yeah. And they are data collector, data analyst organization. And primarily, they're dealing with the reentry populations and homelessness and how that happens with incarceration because their numbers prove that 70% of the people experiencing homelessness have a history of incarceration. Yeah. So they're going to come and they're going to give us a presentation and they're going to okay. be our keynote speaker. I think that this would be uh, leveling up this sum summit to have um, an organization come and present with uh, with two key components, one with housing being our primary focus uh, of our four uh, different areas that we'd like to fund and the things that have come up in our surveys. And I think the homelessness and the housing and with the reentry population and incarceration is a perfect fit. I also think that uh, the presenters will bring a wealth of information and be very informative and um, it will definitely add a lot of a lot to our our summit. And I because I think that one of the things that is crucial is that we continue to build upon the initial summit and to continue to build upon it to make it more appealing, more inviting before we hand it off to another count. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to dig a little bit deeper and do and bring a little bit more. And hopefully the board uh, is in agreement with it and uh, accepts the uh, the offering and uh, moves forward with the suggestions. So our, our presenters are, will be Michelle Burns. Um, I'm probably pronouncing her name incorrectly. The spelling is B-Y-R-N-E-S. And she's a directing analyst. Um, she works with communities throughout California <clears throat> to increase their capacity to address homelessness through technical assistance, training, and individualized support. As a member of Home Base Criminal Home Base's Criminal Legal Systems Initiative, she co-authored No Bars to Home, meeting the housing needs of people impacted by the criminal legal system. She works closely with the Contra Costa Council on Homelessness to center equity, amplify the voices of people with lived experience and improve system performances. She has over two decades of experience working with and on, be and on behalf of underserved communities. And prior to joining Home Base, Michelle worked in the nonprofit and public sectors to promote equitable access to affordable housing and supportive services for youth exiting the child welfare and criminal legal systems, families and seniors. And then her cohort, her uh, partner, Sadi Islam, Sadia, I hope I'm not assassinating her name. She's the policy analyst. As a policy analyst at home base, she works with Bay Area continuums of care to provide training, technical, assist, technical assistance, and support in evaluating and addressing needs and goals according to evidence-based best practices. Prior to joining home base, she specialized, specialized in researching and analyzing legislation pertaining to criminal justice reform. Her experience and expertise extended to facilitating access to legal services for individuals with criminal records, supporting their reentry and reintegration into society. And she also devotes her efforts to a children's advocacy organization where she provides legal support and social work services to children within the foster care system, deepening her commitment to working for and alongside population, populations impacted by structural harm. So both of these with our keynote speakers. Our keynote speakers come with a wealth of uh, information and credentialing. And I think it's a great fit for our work here with CAF. Are there any questions? 
But you guys are working on the agenda. You and and Patrice, yeah. I'm going to get with Patrice when I come back from my vacation. So the next time I'll have a more um, definitive plan for us. Uh, definitely. Okay. More of the agenda should be streamlined. I, you know, I always believe more is better than not enough because you can always, you know, you know, trim down the fat. So we're moving on to item number eight, and that's next steps. Okay. And I'm going to depend on Dariana for our next steps. Yes. So um, if I missed anything, please let me know. <clears throat> next steps, we're going to revisit the work plan discussion. And we're going to discuss, we're going to reassign um, assignments to members. We're going to discuss what items have been attempted. Um, we're going to align the timelines. We're going to revisit task one and discuss what are the goals or the priorities from the work plan that each member are going to take on. We're going to develop or set a schedule for the ambassadors meetings. Um, we're going to update the work plan. And one thing that we were pondering that we can discuss, if not at the next meeting, is how to get faith-based organizations involved in the reentry population. Is there anything that I may have missed? No, I think you did very well, ma'am. I think also next meeting, we will have um, the agenda, the mini summit agenda oh. uh, flushed out. Yeah, we will also have, um, I'll probably leave update on AV 109 mini summit as like a standing agenda item. But yes, um, our goal is to have the draft agenda for the mini summit. That covers all of our uh, yeah. next steps. And with that being said, moving to adjournment, we're adjourned this next adjourn to the next subcommittee meeting on June 18th. 18th. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Gariana. Thank Appreciate you, Gariana. Thank you.